John Dee's smoking mirror is aptly named because, like a smoking gun, it offers direct and irrefutable evidentiary proof of John Dee's direct communication with and influenced by artifacts from the New World. That the mirror is Aztec in origin is beyond any doubt without question. However, the official version of events describing how it got into Dee's hands forwarded by the British Museum in London does seem unlikely. According to this explanation, the mirror once belonged to the Aztec chief Montezuma, representing his divine link with Tezcatlipoca, whose name itself meant smoking mirror. It was given by Montezuma to, or taken from him by, the Spanish conquistador Cortes, and returned home with him whence it was given over to the Holy Roman Emperor and King of Spain then, Charles V. According to theory, it then passed into Dee's hands when he visited Philip II of Spain, Charles V's heir. This event must have happened between 1530, when Cortes returned, and 1575, when the mirror is already known to have been in Dee's possession. This time frame is further complicated by the fact that Philip's reign only began in 1556. This means that the meeting between Dee and Philip could only have taken place between 1556 and 1575. If the meeting occurred after 1558, when Elizabeth I succeeded her Catholic sister, Mary Tudor, then it could only have been with D acting as espionage agent under Francis Walsingham on Her Majesty's Secret Service. It is known that D worked closely, as mentioned in his Enochian journals, with Adrian Gilbert, whose brother founded Newfoundland, that D studied with Gerardus Mercator and procured several globes of the earth from him before 1550 and the D taught several famous explorers the art of navigation and published a geographical treatise. D may have procured his obsidian mirror through Gilbert from Newfoundland, though its origin is almost certainly Aztec. In 1580, while presenting to Queen Elizabeth I her contrived entitlement to a British Empire, including lands in the New World. John Dee makes reference to the Welsh Prince Madoc, who, by the heritage of his father, Owain Gwynedd's mother, a Viking Irish princess, was, during Dee's time, thought to have followed Leif Erikson's route to the southwest of Eric the Red settlement in Greenland. Madoc is said to have taken ten ships of Welsh to North America, where they fought briefly with the Cherokee, before traveling up the Missouri River, where his people interbred with the native Mandans, who later merged with the Hidatsa. The Cherokee, indigenous to the mid-southeast, had been re-encountered in Dee's era as early as the mid-1500s by the DeSoto expedition. The Cherokee tribe name is derived from the Creek for people of a different speech. The Cherokee language is Iroquois, but differs slightly. In their own language, the Cherokee call themselves the Kitawa, or the people of Kitua, and are called Kitua also by the Algonquins. The Montauks, Pharaoh chiefs of the Algonquin and related tribes of the Northeast had been established at Long Island for 3,000 years before they sold Manhattan Island to the Dutch East Indies Trading Company to establish New Amsterdam in 1625. In 1609, Henry Hudson, searching for a new passage on behalf of the Dutch East Indies Company, explored Delaware Bay and the Hudson River Valley. Here, he encountered the confederation of 32 Lenni Lenape tribes, 
whose de facto rulers were the Maintucket tribe of eastern Long Island. The collected tribes of Long Island, known as the Matoac, were ruled by the four sons of Mangachsi, Long Knife, the sachem of the Maintucket family. These four were Pagaticut, ruling the Pogatikets, Winandak, ruling the Maintucket, Nawedino, ruling the Shinnecocks, and Mamowitz, ruling the Karkoogs. The Maintucket and Shinnecocks of eastern Long Island spoke an Algonquin dialect similar to the Pequot, Mohegan, Niantic, and Narangasset, while the other Metoac in central and western Rhode Island spoke a dialect similar to the Metabasic and Wappinger. In 1600, there were probably about 10,000 combined Metoac people living in the Long Island, Delaware Bay, and Hudson River Valley area. Although not officially first written down until the early 1800s by the multilingual Cherokee Sequoia, when, from 1809 to 1821, he invented the talking leaves syllabary, certain letters from this Cherokee syllabary seem, to some scholars, to mimic some of those developed as Enochian letters in late 1581 and early 1582 by John D. and his scrying partner, Edward Kelly. Because the Cherokee syllabary was written down around 360 years after the invention of the Enochian alphabet by D. and Kelly, and was done so by a Cherokee man, whom would have presumably had no knowledge of D. and Kelly's work, it remains an anomaly why these certain letters would seem logographically similar. From all depictions of John D. contrived throughout his lifetime, we can quite clearly see one feature in common marks all as being unique to the man himself, and that is his wandering or strabismic left eye. This condition is called, presently, exotropia defined as the outward deviation of an eye which may occur while fixating on distant objects, nearby objects, or both. Most exotropia is intermittent. The eye deviation occurs only some of the time. However, it can also be a permanent condition, although in such cases it should not be confused with amblyopia, wherein the deviated eye also has decreased capacity for sight. If symptoms of exotropia occur prior to the age of six, the brain cells can rematch the double vision this effect produces, and this is called anomalous retinal correspondence. If the deviation occurs intermittently, it can occur either when looking at objects at a distance 20 feet or more, or when looking at objects close up, 16 inches or closer. If it occurs when looking at distant objects, bifocals may treat the effect cosmetically. However, if the exotropia occurs when looking at objects close up, as was almost certainly true in Dr. D's case, the effect is called convergence insufficiency and can result in diplopia, double vision, headaches, difficulty focusing, dizziness, as well as blurry eyesight. Although strabismus is thought to be caused primarily due to a genetic mutation, it can also come about through injury to the brain. Catalogued as sphere number five, crystal ball in Sphirae, the Oxford newsletter of the Museum of History and Science. Dr. D's six centimeter diameter quartz sphere 
was used as a showstone in his scrying exercises with Edward Kelly. It is not now known if the composition of this crystal ball is alpha quartz, the more common kind, or beta quartz, which has higher symmetry, is less dense, and has a slightly lower specific gravity. However, it is now known alpha quartz can be heated into beta quartz and then cooled back down again into its original state. D's orb itself appears to be smoky quartz, a variety of silicate found in Scotland and the Swiss Alps during D's lifetime, although he claims in his journals, Action 24, Lieber 4, that the showstone was given to him by the angels with whom he communicated. It is known that, in 1552, D and Gerolamo Cardano met in London and, it is possible, procured Dee's infamous smoking mirror from the Society of the New Art there. Operating out of Limehouse in London's East End under Sir Humphrey Gilbert. Although no direct historical record of a brother exists, one Adrian Gilbert alleged half-brother of Sir Humphrey, is mentioned in Dee's diaries as being a close associate from at least this time on. According to the Limehouse legends of this Society of the New Art, it was formed when Martin Frobisher, inspired by Gilbert's advocation of opening a Northwest Passage between Europe and North America, sailed to Baffin Island between Greenland and Canada, from whence he returned with a mysterious black rock, which Frobisher himself, Humphrey, and or Dr. Adrian Gilbert, Lord Burley, better known as William Cecil, and the Earl of Leicester, better known as Robert Dudley, then attempted to transmute into gold. While at Limehouse, working with the Society of the New Art, in 1552, John Dee would have been only 25 years old, still five years the senior of Robert Dudley, but not yet the wizened counselor of royalty he would become later in life. However, since we have no depictions of Dee from prior to this period in his life, we cannot ascertain if his eye condition was inherent from birth or acquired due to injury at some point later on during his life. If the effect occurred due to injury, it should not be ruled out that such could have occurred while attempting to superheat either the quartz sphere, the smoking mirror, or both at Limehouse on the River Thames. On March 10th, 1582, John Dee sat for their first scrying session with Edward Kelly, scrying such as the hydromancy of Nostradamus, the French Catholic seer, and early contemporary to the lifetime of John Dee, was known in Dee's time to be an ancient art, presumably tracing back to an Egyptian magician named Nephates, cognate to the legendary Greek Narcissus. Dee and Kelly's method of scrying was crystal gazing, and focused on Dee's six centimeter diameter crystal ball. Beginning with this first sitting in 1582, Dee and Kelly established what has come to be known since as Enochian magic. It should be strongly noted by any modern practitioner of Enochian magic that there are, in fact, two distinct and separate forms of it developed by Dee and Kelly. The first is the so-called Benorum, or heptarchical system, and this form is what Dee and Kelly used to derive the second, properly Enochian, system of sigils, 
watchtowers, heirs, evocations, etc. While modern practice preserves much of the latter, it seems to see no further use in study of the Benorum method for deriving the properly Enochian system. The method D and Kelly used to communicate with the angels, which Kelly had, at first, seen easily enough through D's showstone alone, ultimately involved seven specific ritual implements. One, the sacred showstone itself. Two, the table of practice, made of sweet wood or laurel, having four legs and a square top. Three, the seven ensigns of creation, an encrypted form of Dies Benorum. Four, the Sigillium Dei Emeth, engraved on perfect wax, nine inches in diameter and an inch and a half thick, as well as on four smaller engraved wax seals to be placed beneath the feet of the table of practice. Five, 49 seals of the Benorum princes placed beneath the feet of the operators. Six, an Enochian ring of Solomon engraved with the name Pele to be worn by D. And finally, seven, the second or holy layman, an as of yet undeciphered array of Enochian letters. D and Kelly seem to have, wittingly or not, created the Benorum or Heptarchical system as a form of double blind to reduce noise and filter out inaccuracies in the scrying process. In this phase of their workings, Kelly would scry and D transcribe only one letter at a time as they composed the Enochian evocations. The seven ensigns of creation were placed on top of the table of practice, and the 49 seals of the Benorum princes were placed beneath the scryer's feet. Each letter location on the seven ensigns related to one of the 49 seals of the Benorum princes, and each of these 49 seals related, in turn, to one of 49 more ministers, each with its own combination of seven letters, all in such a manner that, by Kelly identifying one letter location on the seven ensigns, D could cross-reference this to a specific letter among the names of the Benorum ministers, and thus each letter, one by one, was spelt out in the Enochian language through them. Following this method, D and Kelly composed 18 evocations, and a single final evocation to the 30 Enochian heirs, and together compiled these as the 48 angelic keys. These included along with an oration to God to be spoken three times a day, composed by D, a brief invocation to the Benorum princes, and an abbreviated tablature of which Benorum prince is to be venerated on what day of the week, etc., comprised the entirety of the ritual work intended for the properly Enochian section derived by D. and Kelly, employing the Benorum as a double-blind method. Using the first 18 keys, with the substitution of each of 91 names called by D. the parts of the earth imposed by God, and the key of the 30 heirs, D and Kelly drafted the four watchtowers of 156 square cells each, 12 vertical by 13 horizontal, and placed the parts of earth imposed by God 
each a seven letter name, as sigils connecting letters in each of these more than 624 total cells. According to this method, the 30 heirs, each containing three such seven letter sigils, overlap the four watchtowers, such that each sigil on the surface of each watchtower could occupy multiple levels on the spherical model of the 30 heirs. However, whether all of this was, as D claimed, divinely inspired, or whether D was simply insane, is a matter of ongoing historical dispute, and since with each passing second we get further away from his time period, we are perpetually receding from discovering the truth of this matter. If Dee's work was divinely inspired, one would expect it to have flawless internal consistency and perfect interior continuity. But as any student of Dee's system knows, it does not. The 91 parts of the earth contain some letters in names that fall in the black cross section between the four watchtowers and thus are off the map of their 12 by 13 cells. One other seven letter name, Sigil, lacks Dizzy, appears on this map, but perhaps because it is a proximal duplicate for another name, Laz Dixie, is excluded by D from all his lists of these 91, which are, in fact, thus actually 92. The lowest air, Tex, has four parts of the earth associated with it, while the remaining 29 airs have three each. Many anomalies such as these persist throughout the Enochian material generated by D. N. Kelly, and the real purpose and use for this entire system of magic remains undeciphered to this day. Ultimately, not only is D's derivation of the Enochian magic system an anomaly, but so is everything else about this system of magic as well, including, if any, its originally intended function. In 1556, Dee proposed the founding of a national English library to Queen Mary, but his plan was not implemented. In consequence, Dee amassed the largest library in England at the time using his personal funds, consisting of at least 3,000 printed volumes and a large number of manuscripts. The library was pilfered during Dee's six-year trip to the European continent between 1583 and 1589, and Dee was forced to sell many more volumes upon his return due to penury. After his death in 1608 or 1609, the still considerable remnants of the vaunted library were ransacked until nothing remained. During Dee's long trip to the continent, he sought to supernaturally contact angels through the services of his scryer, Edward Kelly. On the subject of the Book of Soiga, Dee claimed to have questioned the angel Uriel about the significance of the book and asked for guidance. The reply that Dee received was that the book had been revealed to Adam in paradise by angels and could be interpreted by the archangel Michael. The Book of Soiga, also titled Alderia, is a 16th century Latin treatise on magic, one copy of which is known to have been possessed by the Elizabethan scholar John Dee. After Dee's death, the book was thought to be lost until 1994, when two manuscripts were located in the British Library, Sloan Manuscript 8 and the Bodleian Library, 
Bodley Manuscript 908 under the title Aldaria Sivi Soiga Vokor by D. Scholar Deborah Harkness. The Sloan 8 version is also described as Tractatus Astrologico Magicus, though both versions differ only slightly. Jim Reed's notes that the Bodley 908 manuscript consists of 197 leaves, including Liber Alderaia, 95 leaves, Liber Radiorum, 65 leaves, and Liber Decimus Septimus, 2 leaves, as well as a number of shorter and unnamed works, totaling approximately 10 leaves. The final 18 leaves of the manuscript contain 36 tables of letters, the Sloan 8 manuscript consists of 147 leaves, mostly identical to the Bodley manuscript, with the exception that the tables of letters appear on 36 leaves and the Liber Radiorum is presented in a two-leaf summarized version. After Harkness rediscovered the two copies of the book, Jim Reads uncovered the mathematical formula used to construct the tables starting with the seed word given for each table, and identified errors of various types made by the manuscript's scribes. He showed that a subset of the errors were common to the two copies, suggesting that they were derived from a common ancestor which contained that subset of errors, and thus was presumably itself a copy of another work. Although Reeds deciphered the construction algorithm and the code words used in crafting the tables, the actual content and significance of the tables remains mysterious. He writes, The treatise in the Book of Soiga which discusses the tables, Liber Radiorum, has a series of paragraphs mentioning the code words for 23 of the tables, together with number sequences which stand in unknown relation to the words. In cryptography, a Caesar cipher, also known as Caesar's cipher, the shift cipher, Caesar's code, or Caesar shift, is one of the simplest and most widely known encryption techniques. It is a type of substitution cipher in which each letter in the plain text is replaced by a letter some fixed number of positions down the alphabet. For example, with a left shift of three, D would be replaced by A, E would become B, and so on. The method is named after Julius Caesar, who used it in his private correspondence. A construction of two rotating disks with the Caesar cipher can be used to encrypt or decrypt the code. Caesar cipher is a simple substitution based on the sliding of a single ordinary alphabet with fixed key. Once the equivalent of a letter is discovered, all the equivalent cipher letters are known. With the Alberti cipher disk, there are two mixed alphabets, and the key varies continuously during encryption. Therefore, the discovery of a single letter does not permit further progress. Frequency analysis is also impossible because the same letter is always enciphered differently. The Visionary cipher is based on a single, ordinary alphabet, like that of Caesar, and is easily solved after discovering its fixed period by means of the Kasiki exam. This is not possible with Alberti. The Alberti cipher disk, also called formula, is a cipher disk which was described by Leon Battista Alberti in his treatise De Cifris, of 1467. The device embodies the first example of a polyalphabetic substitution with mixed alphabets and variable period and is made up of two concentric disks. The larger one is called stabilis, stationary or fixed. The smaller one is called mobilis, movable. 
The circumference of each disc is divided into 24 equal cells. The outer ring contains one uppercase alphabet for plain text, and the inner ring has a lowercase mixed alphabet for cipher text. The outer ring also includes the numbers 1 to 4 for the super encipherment of a codebook containing 336 phrases with assigned numerical values. In cryptography, the tabula recta is a square table of alphabets, each row of which is made by shifting the previous one to the left. The term was invented by the German author and monk Johann Trithemius in 1508 and used in his book Polygraphia, which is credited with being the first published book on cryptology. Trithemius used the tabula recta to define a polyalphabetic cipher, which was equivalent to Leon Battista Alberti's cipher disk, except that the alphabets are not mixed. The tabula recta is often referred to in discussing pre-computer ciphers, including the Visionaire cipher and Blaise de Visionaire's less well-known autokey cipher. All polyalphabetic ciphers based on Caesar ciphers can be described in terms of the tabula recta. It uses a letter square with the 26 letters of the alphabet following 26 rows of additional letters, each shifted once to the left. This creates 26 different Caesar ciphers. This method removes the letter frequencies from the cipher text, making it appear as a random string or block of data. However, if a person is aware that this method is being used, it becomes easy to break. The cipher is vulnerable to attack because it lacks a key, which is said to break Kirchhoff's principle, a rule of cryptology. In 1550, Girolamo Cardano, 1501-1576, known in French as Jérôme Cardan, proposed a simple grid for writing hidden messages. He intended to cloak his messages inside an ordinary letter so that the whole would not appear to be a cipher at all. Such a disguised message is considered to be an example of steganography, which is a sub-branch of general cryptography. But the name Cardon was applied to grills that may not have been Cardon's invention, and, so, Cardon is a generic name for cardboard grill ciphers. In cryptography, a one-time pad, OTP, is an encryption technique that cannot be cracked if used correctly. In this technique, a plain text is paired with a random secret key, or pad. Then each bit or character of the plain text is encrypted by combining it with the corresponding bit or character from the pad using modular addition. If the key is truly random, is at least as long as the plain text, is never refused in whole or in part, and is kept completely secret, then the resulting ciphertext will be impossible to decrypt or break. The Voynich Manuscript is an illustrated codex handwritten in an unknown writing system. The vellum in the book pages has been carbon dated to the early 15th century, between 1404 and 1438, and may have been composed in northern Italy during the Italian Renaissance. Because the text cannot be read, the illustrations are conventionally used to divide most of the manuscript into six different sections. Each section is typified by illustrations with different styles and supposed subject matter, except for the last section, in which the only drawings are small stars in the margin. Following are the sections and their conventional names. Herbal. Each page displays one or two plants and a few paragraphs of text, a format typical of European herbals of the time. 
Some parts of these drawings are larger and cleaner copies of sketches seen in the pharmaceutical section. None of the plants depicted are unambiguously identifiable. Astronomical contains circular diagrams, some of them with suns, moons, and stars, suggestive of astronomy or astrology. One series of twelve diagrams depicts conventional symbols of the zodiac constellations. Two fish for Pisces, a bull for Taurus, a hunter with crossbow for Sagittarius, etc. Each of these has thirty female figures arranged in two or more concentric bands. Most of the females are at least partly naked, and each holds what appears to be a labeled star or is shown with the star attached by what could be a tether or cord of some kind to either arm. The last two pages of this section, Aquarius and Capricornus, roughly January and February, were lost, while Aries and Taurus are split into four paired diagrams with 15 women and 15 stars each. Some of these diagrams are on fold-out pages, Biological. A dense, continuous text interspersed with figures, mostly showing small naked women, some wearing crowns, bathed in pools or tubs, connected by an elaborate network of pipes. Cosmological. More circular diagrams, but of an obscure nature. This section also has foldouts. One of them spans six pages and contains a map or diagram with nine islands or rosettes connected by causeways and containing castles as well as what might be a volcano. Pharmaceutical. Many labeled drawings of isolated plant parts, roots, leaves, etc., objects resembling apothecary jars ranging in style from the mundane to the fantastical, and a few text paragraphs. Recipes Full pages of text, broken into many short paragraphs, each marked with a star in the left margin. One theory holds that the text of the Voynich manuscript is mostly meaningless, but contains meaningful information hidden in inconspicuous details, e.g. the second letter of every word, or the number of letters in each line. This technique, called steganographia, is very old and was described by Johann Trithemius in 1499, though it has been speculated that the plain text was to be extracted by a cardan grill of some sort. This seems somewhat unlikely because the words and letters are not arranged on anything like a regular grid. Still, steganographic claims are hard to prove or disprove, since stegotext can be arbitrarily hard to find. <laughs>